What's up? I am David Long, here to hang out with you guys a little bit today and do a little bit of Q&A. Let me tell you about what's going on a little bit. Hey buddy, there's my friend Daniel. How you doing today, Daniel? Hope you're doing well, man. I am currently at my mom's Florida house. was really nice to give me her Florida car for her birthday and so I came to her for, for my birthday. She doesn't give me presents for her birthday. That'd be kind of interesting. Upgrade. New potentials unlocked. For my birthday she gave me her Florida car because I got in a car accident last year and I've been riding bikes since then. So I came down here, picked it up, and I'm hanging out here for a couple days checking out some beaches and some delicious restaurants and... How much food do you have? There's that shepherd pie. Almond encrusted eggplants. Almond, are you like falling in love with that? It smells so good. It's taking a little bit of a break. I'm usually working real, real hard all the time and never taking any breaks. And so I'm relaxing a little bit. And of course you can watch Season 1, episode 11, vlog number 11, to see more of the details of this trip. We had a good time. Let's dive into some of these today questions, shall we? Let's see, the first question today that is coming up is someone asked me for a book list, like a reading list of books that I would want to suggest. This is a hard one for me, actually, because believe it or not, I don't really like to read. I don't really like to read books. It's true. If I can get an audiobook, I would prefer the audiobook every single time. I mean, I've always been kind of an audio video learner more than a reading learner. And especially with philosophy, philosophy is almost like a one-to-one -one listening kind of a practice anyways. But not that long ago, I worked on this kind of self-balanced scheduling kind of program and I started putting myself into it. And one of the aspects of it was a thing called everyday lines. Everyday lines are like the things that you're supposed to do every day to be able to touch into all your lines. It's a little bit based on something that I learned from integral life practice. In fact, lines is one of the five aqual ingredients, the quadrants, levels, lines, states, and types. So part of an integral life practice is working on your lines. And so for me to touch in with this, to practice this, I kind of made like body lines, brush your teeth, take a shower, and all, all those kinds of things in like a weekly checklist. Social lines, the things you're supposed to do in your social lines, and mental lines. And one of the things that I've kind of found through this sort of practice is, first of all, that it's really hard to touch all your lines every day, let alone every week. Some of them you need to touch every day, like brush your teeth or whatever, but some lines, like practice guitar or whatever, it can be hard if that's not your main, main thing in life to fit that in every week. So you kind of learn if you can't fit it into your everyday lines, if you want it to be a part of your life, you have to fit it into your everyday lines or it's not going to be in there. Now, I know this is kind of like a long roundabout way of, of talking about this, but one of the things that I've found is the best way to get the most out of your time is to multitask. So this is why I prefer audiobooks, because I'm a good listener and I can listen to an audiobook and paint at the same time. And then I got my information coming in and my outs going out. And so when I'm working on a painting, I'm both expressing myself and taking in information. And it's this great kind of synthesis hybrid of a good use of my time. It's a really great way to optimize at least for me, I find this works. So, long story short, audiobooks. Multitask. It's the way I've kind of learned to get the most out of my time. What audiobooks can I recommend? That's a tough one. I like anything by Joseph Campbell. He's my favorite. Welcome to the Joseph Campbell Audio Collection. Alyosha is here. What's up, Alyosha? Alyosha is a big fan of Krishnamurti. He's read a bunch of Krishnamurti books. I've read a few. I would recommend some Krishnamurti books. I like Eckhart Tolle's books. I've read those. The beginning of freedom is the realization that you are not the thinker. The moment you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You begin to awaken. The reason I like Eckhart Tolle is because as far as some of these newer meditation guys, he doesn't demonize the mind or the self. He says that your mind is your best tool. It's not that you use your mind wrongly. It's that you don't use your mind at all. The mind uses you. It's like the instrument has taken you over, right? So he's got this real good, not that superstitious way of talking about it, which I think is good. Also a big fan of Sam Harris. I would definitely encourage people to check out any and all of his books. I mean, it's good to know what's going on. The Integral Vision is a good beginner's book, and you can get a brief history of everything and the theory of everything on audiobook, but my personal favorite Ken Wilber starter is the Cosmic Conscious Interview Series, which happens to be audio. 
I definitely spent a lot of time learning about Christianity from Bart Ehrman, and I really like a lot of his work. When I first declared myself agnostic, I was amazed at how militant both agnostics and atheists can be about their terms. Every agnostic I met thought that atheists were simply arrogant agnostics. And every atheist thought that every agnostic was simply a wimpy atheist. I have come to think that, in fact, they are not two degrees of the same thing. They're two different kinds of thing. Agnosticism has to do with epistemology, what you know. And atheism has to do with belief, what you believe. I actually consider myself to be both an agnostic and an atheist. I'm an agnostic because if somebody says to me, is there a greater power in the universe? My response is, how the hell would I know? So I'm an agnostic. If somebody were to ask me, do you believe in the God of the Bible? Do you believe in a God who interacts with the world, who intervenes in the world, who answers prayer? Do you believe in a supernatural divine being? No, I don't believe it. So I'm an atheist, but I don't know. So I'm an agnostic. And since I'm a scholar, I prefer to emphasize knowledge rather than belief. And so I tend to identify as an agnostic. This book in particular is a college textbook. This guy, Bart Ehrman, he has learned to study the original copies in Coptic and Hebrew and Greek. If you went and took a class on the New Testament, this is the textbook you would get. <laughs> Look at this guy. He needs to work out. Haven't been working on your body lines, huh? What? Are you mocking me? Well, yeah, I am. What's happening here? Well, you're making it, dummy. Well, this is just insane. Let's put an end to this immediately. No! No! So, I'm a big fan of all of Malcolm Gladwell's work. The idea of advantage, and particularly looking at when we see asymmetrical conflict. Read the popular books. Definitely study the classics. I'm a big fan of Nietzsche. His books are fun. One thing I would really suggest in terms of the audiobook, audio podcast type of stuff is I really like the Partially Examined Life. A philosophy podcast by some guys who were at one point set on doing philosophy for a living, but then thought better of it. The Partially Examined Life podcast. What they do is something kind of like what Alyosha and I do with our integral review, where they read a book separately and then come together and then talk about it and then kind of go through it and quote passages and all that kind of stuff. It's really good, rigorous philosophy, secondary sources, but super in-depth and you get a bunch of different perspectives who have a bunch of different perspectives on other philosophers and then they'll tell you what other philosophers think and stuff like that. Philosophy is cool because it's this unfolding narrative where different people comment on the narrative as it unfolds and you have almost like the same kind of conversation that changes forms and shifts through time. It's pretty interesting. So the great thing about a more in-depth view of philosophy is learning to understand what other philosophers say about other philosophers. What philosophers influence the philosophers that you like and th this kind of thread of of a conversation, like Nietzsche is reacting against modernity as well as traditionalism, and he was the student of Wagner. He's really interested in tragedies and things like that. He's also kind of taken up the style of Heraclitus, these sort of aphorisms and speaking more in poetry, not so much like Kant and some of these other people who are like really structured with their logic and stuff. So, I mean, I guess I'm just saying it's good to, to understand the bigger picture conversation. I would also highly suggest The Teaching Company, which I guess changed their name to The Great Courses series. They have tons of full lecture series from the best teachers all over the world, and I have definitely spent a good amount of time watching the videos and checking out the audios of these different series. One of my favorites in this series is called Interpreting the 20th Century, The Struggle Over Democracy. The professor is Pamela Ratcliffe. She does an awesome job. It is a 48 lecture series. Each lecture is 30 minutes. Also, my homie Bart Ehrman has a lecture series in this as well called Lost Christianities and the Battle Over Authentication. I think it has a similar amount of lectures in it. In the lecture series, How Jesus Became God, distinguished scholar of Christianity and New York Times bestselling author Bart Ehrman explores the events that led to the faith tradition of Jesus being the Son of God. How Jesus Became God, taught by Professor Bart Ehrman. Order it now from The Great Courses. Also, let me suggest the Radio Lab podcast. All of its episodes are some kind of weird collision between science and philosophy, music and interviews and drama. That's part of the beauty of Radio Lab is that it somehow creates all of these different fascinating problems and challenges. Now, in Owen's case, he had these movies. He could play them again and again and again. And we wonder, why would that be? And why and how could a Disney movie help Owen with his artist? I really love the sound design in the episodes. It really makes it feel like you're watching a documentary in your head, and all the topics are super interesting. Highly recommend it. Telling stories is a deeply musical act, no matter what.
its pitches, contours of sounds, rhythm. A lot of it is trying to get the textures and the ingredients to behave the way you want them to, which I imagine is like a chef's problem. You're listening, listening to Radio Lab. So while I personally don't like to read books, I do like to know about everything. Obviously, I think it's good to find the best, smartest, best source on something. Who's the expert? Spend the most time with them. I definitely think you can find poor man's approach to a certain topic. Like Joseph Campbell, to me, is like the king of comparative mythology. Someone like Jordan Peterson is like a really poor man's version of Joseph Campbell. He doesn't do comparative mythology as skillfully. Both students of Jung. I think it's good to know Jung's work. It's good to know Freud's work. Yeah, read it all. <laughs> Maybe that's not a good answer. Maybe it's more than you wanted to hear. I don't know. As will I am certain I speak a new language, as is always the first sign of a new age. I am come to tell you she is here. Saul Williams is one of my favorite rappers, but he's also one of my favorite poets. And I really like his poetry books, especially Said the Shotgun to the Head, because it's all about our attitude towards nature. Mother Nature's a whore, said the shotgun to the head. And it smelled like teen spirit, angst-driven, insecure, a country in puberty, a country at war. The sacred feminine and goddess worship. Most beloved, I am certain of nothing more than your existence. A thousand ants when under a log may find themselves exposed to my childlike search for you. My colleague, flower. I'm eternally destroyed by your love no longer my eligible for any workers' pension. My friends laugh at me and talk behind my back. They say that you've changed me, and I am. And I think it's beautiful. I've also really been enjoying the gospel of hip-hop by Glassmaster KRS-One or Knowledge Reigns Supreme over nearly everyone. Big thanks to my buddy Jimmy Lucero for sending me that book. If you want to get involved in this conversation, if you have some questions, Daniel, Alyosha, anybody else who might be watching, feel free to to type them up and post them below and we'll try and get to them. Let's see next. Tony Garrett was asking me about an integral approach to management. I mean, a couple years ago, maybe. I made a video for Brett Thompson. He does the Stegen integral management. He has lots of management tools. And I took his, what is called the integral leadership Rosetta Stone. Basically what he's saying is that there's a bunch of different styles of leadership and they correlate to stages. And what most people do is they kind of have a one size fits all approach to management. That Maslow quote, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem starts to look like a nail. So he basically says that there's a blue style of leadership, a orange style of leadership, a green style of leadership, and I guess a red style of leadership. The red style of leadership is autocratic. Basically, if you're dealing with people who are red, that's like some totalitarian leadership. You are the boss. You're going to tell these people what to do and they're going to listen to you. But usually this isn't like a business style of leadership. Usually this is more like in prisons and stuff like that. Yeah, Alyosha, exactly. Like dealing with kids. Sometimes it's in businesses as well. Ask Trump. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people people probably do apply that in business, but nobody enjoys working for those people. So the next style of leadership, the authoritarian style, the more traditional style of leadership, people need guidance. Like the difference between dealing with someone in a, at a blue stage and dealing with someone at like a green stage or an integral stage is that people at blue want rules. They want guidance. They do need some kind of structure handed down. And if you say to them, just you do it, you handle it, you figure it out, they're not going to do well. They need guidance and structure. At orange, it's called strategic leadership. This is particularly good in sales. This is where you want to have some form Form of incentives like they would have in the sales types environments. Then the more green kind of style is collaborative leadership, like we space team building kind of stuff. And it's a lot more loose. It can be rough because if you're a more mature person, like I was saying, and you do go to work in some of these places in these lower kinds of management styles, it can be really uncomfortable. And so Tony's question was about figuring out how to deal with a bunch of people when you have a diverse set of people who you're working with, employees, and you have to manage a team that has a bunch of different kinds of people on it. This is a tough question. I would say that you probably want to figure out what your general altitude is, what the general kind of consensus is, and then probably make your main leadership style around that and probably incorporate in some of the team stuff with it if it's mostly strategic. And then if you have some people who are more traditional and they need a little bit more guidance, come up with structures and checklists and things to give them what they need. Be able to recognize, okay, this person, they're traditional, they might need a little bit more guidance and structure. And this person over here, if I put too much structure and rules and stuff on them, they're going to be really uncomfortable. And so you can kind of flex flow. That's what we do as integralists. We try to figure out what's going to be the most appropriate for the situation. But I would say there are probably good things from all of these different styles that we could incorporate, especially if we have a, a dynamic group. She asked, are some holons more important than others? 
objectively or subjectively? I think I understand what he means by this question. Holons, if you don't know, a holon is something that is both simultaneously a part of something and a whole with subparts, right? So like I'm a holon because I'm a part of an ecosystem, I'm a part of an environment, I'm a part of this call right now with other people, I'm a part of the internet, right now. I'm a part of all of this bigger process that's going on. And also there are processes within me. Like for example, there's an ecosystem of life happening in my mouth right now. I'm like a universe unto myself. So the question is, in this kind of regard, like what's more important? There's actually a distinction about this in Integral. Ken Wilber calls it the distinction between the fundamental and the significant. So for example, individuals are more fundamental because you need individuals to make up a collective, but collectives are more important, more significant. Another way to think of it would be like there's atoms and molecules and cells and they're totally fundamental to what it is to be me. But what I can do in the world, what I can make, is actually far more significant than what a cell or a molecule or any of that stuff can do. I would say that's an objective way of making this distinction. It's not just subjective, like, well, I happen to like me, <laughs> so I'm more important. There's this situation of what we call rhizomatic contagion. Let's see. Living holons have a dominant monad, if I'm not mistaken. Basically, he's saying that living things matter more, probably because they can feel pain. And also, when we talk about something mattering or being good or bad, usually what we're talking about has to do with the well-being of conscious creatures. So rhizomatic contagion. Anytime you get to say those words, you should, because they're fun to say. And basically what that means is there are these pressures from the top down and pressures from the bottom up, nature and nurture, right? Nature from the bottom up and nurture from the top down that come together to create the whole on. David is a combination of my nature and the nurture that has been put upon me. The reason I bring this up is because the reason I do everything I do is to help the bigger whole. But at the same time, to really be able to do that skillfully, I need to take care of my body. I need to live well. I need to take care of my vehicle. This is fundamental to my ability to do things that are significant. Okay, I think that probably makes sense, and that covers that issue, and it leads nicely into Brett's question. He asked me if integral theory was synthetic philosophy or if it was analytic philosophy. And I had to look this up because I didn't know what he meant by synthetic philosophy. The duality that I've heard before is like continental versus analytic. Or maybe that's more of like a styles in academia kind of distinction. This kind of synthetic versus analytic distinction seems to be about like an analytic philosophy in this view. Basically, it's like a useful way of talking about things that could semantically work. And I'm guessing that a synthetic philosophy actually is talking about real objective reality. The rubber meets the road in some kind of way. And correct me if I'm wrong, Brett, in trying to understand this, but basically I think he's asking is, is integral just like an ideology? And it's hard because to some extent, I think it's a little bit of both. If you realize that all of our ways of talking about things are just relative terminology, like why is it called evolution? Someone named it evolution and then we all agreed that that's what it was called and continued to call it that. But evolution itself is an objective fact. It's a well-established theory. It's demonstrable. So I would say integral is in that kind of a vein where a lot of the terms might be slightly arbitrary, but the distinctions are objective. It's important to know anyways that the map is not the territory. And if you really understand this, then you understand that our best objective maps are relative maps. But maybe he's asking, is it just a religious worldview? Is it just another ism? And I would say it's not just another ism because it transcends and includes, and hopefully if you're doing it right, harmonizes all the other isms. If it's a meta-ism, it is an ism-ism. Ism? <laughs> That's what Brett says. If it's a metaism, it's an ismism. Every theory almost can become an ideology, especially if not understood correctly in the right context, I'm guessing that is. I can't see. I'm trying to press see more, but every time I press, ah, oh, see more. Oh, see more, this is so sudden. It's asking me to, to like it or whatever, so. Well, I liked it. Brett also asked me if my music is integral. I made a video like a year or so ago about my own personal development in relationship to music, and I kind of talk about the stages of development that I went through. But yeah, my music is integral, explicitly integral. In fact, I would say it's musically integral too, because it's sort of a hip hop, indie rock cluster combination. The cool thing about the music that I make, the actual music, is that I really feel like I can make anything I want. Let's see, did I listen to Eminem's new album, Kamikaze? If you did, what's your opinion? <laughs> no, I didn't listen to it. I'll just say that yet. Yeah, I've, I've heard about it. I know his last album got really bad reviews. I've outgrown Eminem a long time ago. I'm not really that interested in what he's got going. But one interesting thing that came out of it is he was trash talking Tyler, the creator, a little bit. From what I understand, he said something like, you call yourself a shit guy. And the word shit guy in this context, not only did Eminem bleep it, like where it wasn't even on there, but he also caught a ton of flack for it. And this is interesting because I feel like when I first started, listening to Eminem, he probably threw around that word all the time and it wasn't even considered to be that big of a deal. So 
I think the times are definitely changing. The zeitgeist is coming around. I cuss. I say ish in this of time. My ass, but I don't say shit. Uh, I would never degrade females in my music. Obviously not gay people or other races or the N-word or any of that stuff. Like, that's just not content for my music, which isn't really holding it to a high standard or anything like that. But I'm just saying, I would never put any of that in my music. Now, notice, though, that I did say the word gay guy when we were talking about the word gay guy, because I think that there is no such thing as bad words, right? It depends on what you're saying. If you're saying, I would never say that word in my music. <laughs> because I think it's bad to talk about people like that. Clearly, you're not using it in a derogatory, hateful, or mean way, right? And I think that when Paula Dean gets in trouble or Roseanne Barr gets in trouble, I don't think that the news reporter should come on and be like, oh, they said the N-word. I think they should say Roseanne Barr or Paula Dean called somebody. And I think we should let the shock of that sink in a little bit. That that's what they said. That's what they're calling somebody. We're adults here. Can we not know the difference between referencing the word and saying the word to insult somebody or hurt somebody? I hope we can. Yes, I bleeped it too, but I'm talking about how I think things should be, not how things actually are. I'm trying to keep this channel mostly PG-13, you know? Getting back to the question, <laughs> yeah, I think that my music is musically integral all by itself. Like, I really feel like I can go anywhere I want with my music. And when I get done, I'll post that documentary or that video I was talking about before on my musical development and the music that I think correlates to different stages of development. I think that's really a thing. Not only historically, obviously, but also in a person's development, right? Like, there's little kid music because kids don't don't listen to complicated music. Their mind isn't used to parsing apart the different instruments and stuff. It's very simple kid music. And then my friend Kevin, he likes to say that jazz is torture for idiots <laughs> because it just sounds like a mess. They're not able to hear it like a musician would hear it. They don't have the musical intelligence to be able to understand the cacophony of sound that's happening. And that's not to say that all jazz is awesome. Some of it sounds a bit like a mess, but yeah, I definitely think there's such a thing as musical intelligence and that certain stages of development like particular kinds of music. For example, I think that people at more modern stages of development tend to like more progressive kinds of music, maybe like math rock kind of stuff, whereas Green is more into the like jam band kind of stuff, the more improv -y, loose sort of style. And my favorite band, the Mars Volta, is kind of right in the middle. They have these really tight parts like <laughs> And then these like long jazz fusion Latin space jams, which are awesome. If you don't listen to Mars Volta, I would highly suggest you go check out the Mars Volta album. Maybe like Deloused in the Comatorium or Francis the Mute. And there's patterns that you can notice with lyric structure with these stages too as well. Like I feel like Green likes to go a little bit more abstract with the lyrics which is kind of interesting. Either just saying random things and putting random words together or using words like colors to kind of paint emotional pictures, which is interesting. But my music is like a good combination, I think, of explicit pointed stuff as well as poetry. But judge for yourself. I'd be interested to hear what y'all think about some of that. Let's see, what, what kind of other stuff do I got coming down the pipe? Alyosha and I last week finished recording our integral review response to Mario's review of our Jordan Peterson podcast. If you didn't understand what I just said, we made a Jordan Peterson podcast a while back, and then this guy, Mario, made a response video. Hello, David. Hello, Alyosha. I want to make a few comments on your podcast. And then we spent some time and responded to his response and reviewed his review. So that's going to be coming out pretty soon. Also, keep your eyes out for an integral review coming out on the pickup community which I learned about to be able to hang a little bit in that conversation, but mostly Alyosha is the expert when it comes to that kind of stuff. But that was a really interesting talk as well. I don't know if you caught it or not, but definitely go back and check out our talk about Michael Pollan and psychedelics. That was a fun one. I'm also putting some finishing touches on my album. I'm so close to being done with it. My buddy Kai and I, we have been working on trying to do some more tests for that reflection music video. And man, 
his work is so cool. I want to say he's a photographer, but he's really so much more. My video production partner, Kai Drauschenberg, he is so amazing. The stuff that he's doing, he's built these like infinity mirror boxes and he puts a camera on the inside of them and he gets these pictures that almost look like they're digital fractal mandalas, but they're all practical and real. As soon as he showed me these things, I was like, I need to figure out how to get inside of that thing and we need to make a music video on the inside. So we've been doing all kinds of tests with mirror boxes and things like that. A lot of musicians, they, they get with a director afterwards and they're like, yeah, do your thing with it. But I actually wrote this song with his art in mind. I was inspired by his photography to want to make something in his world. So I'm really excited about trying to get that together and showing that. Whew. I think we're probably coming to the end here. Unless anyone else has any kinds of last minute questions or anything. Mm -hmm. Thanks to everybody who came out today and spent some time listening to me. Thanks for everybody who's watching in the future, who made it this far. I've been uploading all these Q&As to YouTube, editing them down a little bit, taking those ums out and whatnot. I'm also trying to figure out some more interviews to do. I've been trying to figure out how to get the days and the times right to be able to do one with Julian Mark Walker. I really am excited about that. But keep your eye out. I got a lot of stuff coming out here soon. And man, it's a good thing I'm on this vacation because it is overwhelming. <laughs> I am overwhelmed. I do so much stuff. I don't want to complain though. I'm so happy to be able to spend this time with you and to be able to answer some of these questions and I hope you enjoyed it. All right, hold on a second. Make sure you like and subscribe. Ring that bell down there. Support me on Patreon. I super appreciate your support. Big thanks to my current Patreons. Check out these other videos and I will see you next time. Now you go. Peace.